Good morning. Welcome to Memorial Baptist Church. Um, if you're in the building with us, we're taking communion today. So if you did not pick up your communion in the back, you can go ahead and do so. And there are offering plates in the back to place your offering in if you would like to do so later. Let's pray. Gracious Almighty God, we come into your house, however that may look today, wherever we may be. We do so together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask you through the power of your Holy Spirit to unify us, to allow us to meet you today in worship, through the music, through the prayers, through the giving of our offering, our confessions, our communion time, and listening to your word. Lord, allow us to meet you face to face today so that when we leave here, in a little bit, we are, we are different, we are changed, having been in your presence. Amen. Good morning. I'm back in 1982 again, and I've had finished my spring semester in Austria, and I was getting ready to go to a camp for the summer in central Germany to work for a few weeks. Had it all planned out. Had a hotel lined up. I had a few rooms. I was going to go to this little town that was near the camp called Bad Hersfeld, and I was going to hang out there and check out the sites and had it all mapped out. Got on the train in Frankfurt, and Bad Hersfeld was just 20 minutes east train just kept going and going and going. And an hour into the ride, I went to the conductor and I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to Hanover, which was on the other side of Germany at that time. And I went, oh, three hours on the train instead of 20 minutes. And all my plans went up in smoke. And as a 20-something, I was just panicked. What do I do? I'm going to get there at midnight. I know if I hadn't booked anything ahead of time, it was crazy that summer. All, everything was booked by tourists and everything else. You couldn't find a place to stay. And I knew when I get there, I'd have to probably sleep under a tree. Well, we get to Hanover. It's midnight. I've got my big backpack on my back. I'm, and I'm walking through the park. And I'm looking for a park bench. And I hear a woman's voice behind me. She goes, these are rucksack schwer. That means, is my backpack heavy, difficult to carry? And I knew enough German to understand what she had said, and I turned around, and here's a woman who was in her late 60s, and she had a man standing behind her holding her suitcases, and she says, is das schwer? Is your backpack difficult? I said, yeah, yeah. I knew how to say ja, yeah. yes. And she said, then, and she said in German, and I, again, I could just understand enough German at that time that I could understand what she was saying because she didn't know any English. And she said, well, then you're coming with me. I said, what? You're coming with me. And I, I, I said, you don't even know me. She said, I just came from Detroit, Michigan to see my family for the first time there. They treated me like a queen. And, and I promised myself that the first American I see when I get back to home in Germany, I'm going to treat them like a prince or a king or a queen or whatever. And there I was. Make a long story short, she took me out to the outskirts of Hanover. She lived in a lovely town home there. Uh, she had some lovely friends there. She treated me like a king. We had wonderful dinners, and and oh, she had this ice cream with big chocolate chunks and an apricot syrup on it. It was like oh, it was wonderful. But the most wonderful thing was, and her name was Margit Schmidt. She was an answer to prayer for me because I was a lonely 20-something, all by myself in Europe, and I, I, God had put a longing in my heart for a, a Christian to be there, to talk about faith, to pray with, and here she was. She had a vibrant faith in Christ. We walked through the park. I didn't understand half of what she said, but we communicated a lot to each other, and I was with her for three days, and it was just, it was just a recharging of my spiritual batteries. It was amazing. 
and I'm very grateful for that. And I, I thought about that because I was I was reading our, the passage I'm about to read to read to you in Psalm 23, and and um, the Lord is my shepherd; I lack nothing. And I realized I lacked nothing at that moment in Central Germany with this woman who it, it was it wasn't coincidence; it was not. And I feel very blessed by that. So in that vein, let's worship together in our call to worship and attend to the word of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I, shall, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Lord, guide me as my shepherd. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, teach me to trust you and to follow you all the days of my life. Join me in our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 10. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. When Jesus, when Jesus, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. Me love. 
We have in our house um, a five-year-old, Soren, who just started kindergarten two weeks ago. With the hybrid model at the schools, the way that Soren goes to school, the other kids go two days, then they have remote learning one day and then work at home Thursday and Friday. But Soren goes four days a week with remote learning on Wednesday at home. And uh, I kind of agonized about sending him to kindergarten this year because he is a, a really young five-year-old. He turned five in August. But the reason after a lot of prayer, we decided to send him, and it was a prayerful four-month decision. Lord, what do we do? And the reason that we sent, decided to send him to kindergarten was because we knew he needed his services. During the pandemic and the quarantine era, it was, it was really difficult to Zoom everything for him, like PT, OT, audiology, he has sign language classes, etc. So, prayerful decision to make. And so this was his first really kind of full week. <laughs> he is not a fan of kindergarten. Not a fan. Um, he's science to me every day. I do not like school. <laughs> no. His sign instructor tells the ceiling time he gets excited is when he knows who's picking him up. And every day he signs the correct one of us, <laughs> which one we told him that morning is picking us up. Um, part of the reason he doesn't like it is because it is stretching him physically and emotionally as well as what he's having to learn. Soren um, now has to get up at 6 a.m. in order for me to give him enough bolus feeds through his G-tube to last him until he gets home. He eats orally at school. For Soren, that is like the dead of night because he is a solid, do not wake me and give me my baby coffee until 8 a.m. kid, right? So he gets up at six and he's got like his eyelids are being held by toothpicks as he goes into school and he hates it. And this week he lost weight, which Soren cannot afford to lose weight. And so I said to Mitchell, this is just too hard. I don't want to push him. Let's just pull him. He can go next year, right? And Mitch, of course, being Mitch, says, oh, this is good for him. This is really good for him. Um, and nobody wants him to lose weight. Nobody wants him to suffer. But we also know that Soren is, is a child that needs to be pushed. Because um, what he wants to do is go back to what's comfortable and what's easy, which was preschool. He was a rock star in preschool. So this week, walking through that with our son, I also walked through that with a lot of people in our church, who for right now, this is as difficult of a time of stretching us as little Soren going to kindergarten. And so my temptation, I think, as a parent is to always say, oh, it's okay, we'll just go back to what's easy. But we can't go back to what's easy because just like Soren, you know, going to school, God is using this time. Not that God can use this time. God is using this time to grow us, to grow us and to stretch us. And it is difficult. And so the, the <laughs> resistance to growth is there. And so my prayer has been for us all week to, to lean into God, as we've already sung today, to trust him and to allow him to lead us through this and to not necessarily make it easy, but to know that he is with us through it. We're going to start with a corporate prayer. We'll close in the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to the Lord this morning. God, we are so grateful the way that you parent us, the way that you grow us and, and you lead us and you develop us, and we know that that is every bit as scary for us as adults as it is for little Soren. Right now feel uh, in many ways disconnected. We feel isolated for many of us. We feel like this has really truly been a bridge too far. And so Father, we know that in all things you are working for the good of your believers. So we pray for that knowledge to be not just a Bible verse, but a heart knowledge that we know that you are leading us, that you are stretching us, and that you are growing. And and Father, we pray very sincerely and ardently during this time that you would just impress upon our hearts that when it gets scary and difficult that we lean into you, that we allow you to lead us as we have just read in the 23rd Psalm and sung, that 
to lead us through those dark patches and paths. Father, we ask for the ways that uh, we need healing in our congregation and in our community. We pray for those who are recovering from illness. Pray for those of us who are sitting today with um, unsure of diagnosis or, or just discovering one. Pray, Lord, for those of us who are, are walking through real and present danger with jobs or with money or with relationships. And we pray for your wisdom and discernment and your peace. Pray, Lord, as a body of believers, as we begin to look into leadership for the next year, that we would seek you in discernment, that if you're calling us, that we would hear that and you would lay it on our heart in a real and present and discernible way for us to understand and to follow. And Lord, today we seek the courage to follow you, to be able to step out of our places of comfort into the places in which we are scared and alone, feels dark. We lay before you, Lord, our, our concerns and our needs. Pray most especially for growth this year. Not so much growth in numbers, but growth in our own spiritual maturity. Growth in ways that we can hear you and live by you. Ways that we can influence and preach and teach and testify to your goodness in this world. And God, we know right now, which seems like darkness all around us, that there are real and present ways to speak into people's lives. So we pray for that fertile soil. Pray for family members who we are crying out for them to know you in a real way. Give us the temerity, Lord, to speak into situations. Lead us, guide us. Allow in all that we do for people to look at us and see you in us, we pray. Pray these things in your name, in the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. reading is taken from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 14 to 23. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his, into his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. <clears throat> so we left last week, having started this new sermon series on uh, the Shepherd King, looking at the life of David by just considering what it meant to have a different set of eyes. 
So last week, as we closed, it was just, what if the only thing that we're, we're really considering at this point in time going into our week is that all that we've taught, been taught, or we have taught, to be uh, good and beautiful and worthy of our attention to look at, maybe is not the same thing that God sees as good and beautiful and worthy of our attention to look at. It's a, it's a decision to have a perspective change given to us by God, by, by having God's eyes for his kingdom. So the question I left with last week is, what if we just considered what does it mean to have God's eyes for his kingdom? An upside down kingdom where, as I said last week, the deformed are often beautiful, where power is meaningless, and the weak are strong in him. So over the weeks going from now until Advent, we're going to look at what it means to have God's eyes, questioning over and over again, what does that look like? What does that mean to have God's eyes? And it's not a rubric, it's not a system, it's not an incantation, it's not some wand that we wave over each other as Christians and hypnotize ourselves so that we we just see certain things. It's not having blinders on to the world around us. It's understanding what God reveals in front of us when we're in his will, when we're doing God's will. So it's a change of perspective that ties us to God. There's never a point when we as children of God outgrow our need for God. So just like we need to be tied to God for that agape and love, we need to be tied to God for God's eyes. So this is in direct relationship with God, to have a perspective change. And we're going to see this through David's eyes, through his story, um, means that we grow in our relationship with God. And so that's the key. In order to have perspective change and to have God's eyes to be able to be tied to God is that God is going to stretch us and grow us from spiritual infants to spiritually mature senior citizens. Now, it is not a chronological age. So you can be a spiritually mature senior citizen far younger than a spiritually immature senior citizen. What, what, what moves that is not your chronological age, it is our willingness to submit to God to grow us. The problem with that, and the reason that, that we can easily stay spiritually immature infants and be 45, is because it's scary. When God begins to change us and grow us, it is as scary to us as kindergarten is for Soren right now. And our temptation when we get into those places of growth is to run back to our preschool and say, this is comfortable. I know this area. I was a rock star back here. Keep me back here, Lord. And yet God is, is moving us into a new place. This week in our devotionals, if you listen to them, Oswald Chambers in My Utmost for His Highest had this line describing this process of fear when God calls us to grow, and he said this. Many people have turned back because they are afraid to look at things from God's perspective. The greatest spiritual crisis comes when a person has to move a little bit further on in their belief than their faith, than their beliefs have already accepted. So the greatest spiritual crisis comes when a person has to move a little bit further on in their faith than the beliefs have already accepted. So this change in perspective, this new set of eyes, takes place in that space, that distance between where my beliefs that I have currently grown in my faith end and where God is moving me. And that space is, is faith it takes to move through our set of beliefs to where God is moving us in our lives in growth. The reason that it is scary is that oftentimes that space is a dark room that we walk into. 
You know when you walk into a room that's dark from light and you have to completely reorient your eyes and you can't see anything? And it completely throws off equilibrium and your mind because everything is dark and scary and you don't know where anything is. That's what it is like when you take that first step out of the known beliefs and God is stretching you to grow. So Oswald Chambers says when we get to that place, this, this space between what we know and where God's taking us is that our instinct is to run away. Now, the great irony in that is if we're too scared to walk through that space with God and we run, then we never get to see where God's taking us. We never get to see where God is moving us through in his eyes. If we run back to preschool every time God wants to move us up in a grade, then we never get to grow. What God is, is asking of us is, is not to not be scared, but to be willing to walk through him, with him, in that dark space. And the only way that you can go from known beliefs to grow in that, to where God wants us to move into the next phase spiritually in our lives, is to seek God's discernment. We have to seek God's will through discernment in our lives. Now, oftentimes I will use the word discernment and direction interchangeably, but, but they're, they're really kind of two different things in a way in the sense of how we use them. Um, more often than not, as Christians, what we will do is we will avoid God's will as much as possible until we get stuck. And then we need God's direction. And so we go to God for help. And that's not bad. That's, that's, that's great. But ultimately, the difference between seeking God's will and discernment and seeking God's direction is before we perceive we have gotten stuck, we go to God daily. So the idea of, of waiting until we think we got stuck is still me being in control of my direction. It's just me getting to a fork in the road and saying, okay, Lord, which way do I go? Before we get into the fork in the road, we should be seeking God's will through discernment way back. It should be a daily thing. Now, this does not mean that we wake up in the morning and we're paralyzed on the side of our bed going, Lord, which foot do I put down first? Because I don't know what to do with my life, right? That's not what it means. But it does mean that we go to God daily asking for his will, discerning how to move through all of the places that he wants us to go. I get shocked and amazed sometimes by how many times as Christians we don't actually seek God's will in discernment. We just want God's blessing. Or we want God's approval. You know, God tell me which job to take because I'm stuck. Or, or God tell me which relationship to have. Or we, or we get into it and then we just want God to approve what we're already doing. The difference between seeking God's discernment or seeking God's blessing is, is asking God for direction daily versus just asking God to not get you stuck. When we seek God's will in discernment, it does not mean that having God's eyes is all of a sudden going to open us up to this array of all the things that are taking place in our lives. Um, it doesn't mean that when we seek God's will, he's going to just reveal everything that he wants us to do in that moment. I, I think there's lots of reasons why that isn't the case, but it can be a frustrating place to be in. And that's why it feels like we're walking from the light into a dark room. As we grow in the Lord, as we, as we begin to be spiritually mature adults and then eventually senior citizens, we're still going to be asked to walk into those dark rooms. It's just the difference with our eyes in God means that we're able probably at that time to be able to discern the large objects in the room that we need to avoid. But there's never going to be a point where we walk into the room and we, the lights come on and all of a sudden everything is crystal clear because we still, as Psalm 23 says, need to have God lead us. When I was a child, and then when I was a teenager, and then when I was an adult, I would say to my dad over and over again, what is God doing? What is God doing in my life? My dad would say the same phrase over and over again. Darling, 
I'm on a need-to-know basis with the Lord, and he tells me what I need to know and when. That brings no comfort. That is so frustrating. I just want him to tell me what I'm doing, and I can get on with my life. But that is me seeking God's blessing, and that's not seeking discernment. I think part of the reason God does not spread out our lives before us is because we really honestly are not ready to see it. We're not ready to see it. I was thinking this week, seven years ago this month is when God was discerning in my life, we were discerning in our lives to come to Vermont. And if at any point that week, seven years ago, when we're discerning and praying, God has said, not only are you going to move and, and be a pastor of a church, but in that time, we're going to put three more kids in your life, right? What? I wasn't ready to have those kind of eyes. So God does not reveal. And you see this in an amazing way in David's story. But it's not just that God doesn't reveal. It's that we, without discernment, cannot see what is happening right in front of our eyes. We cannot see what is invisible, what is mysterious, and how God is working. And that sounds like a no-brainer, and we accept that in the physical world, but we don't accept that in our theological world. For instance, I cannot see atoms. You cannot see atoms with a naked eye, but we all accept that they make up the entire physical world. But as soon as it comes to God's plan, and we see no evidence of it in our lives in front of us, what do we do? We automatically assume he must not have a plan. He must not be working. So the, the role of discernment is so critical because when there is no evidence of God's plan, God is working. And the only way you know how to make it through that dark room is to have God lead you, is to be tied to him and listening to him to see which way to go. And you see that again today in the story of David. This quizzical story you've heard Scott read, um, a wonderful, phenomenal story that you kind of just skip over in 1 Samuel to get to the good part, and the good part is when David fights Goliath. But David is not ready for that battle yet because God is still working on David's eyes. So last week when we left David, David had just been anointed the second king of Israel. Samuel had put oil on his head so he not only looks different, but he smells different. He stands out apart from his big, strong, strapping brothers. And then the next day, what does he do? Goes back out into the fields. Goes back to being a shepherd. Talk about being anticlimactic. The day after I got my doctorate, I thought, for sure, I'm going to wake up the next day and the world is going to be different. You know? I asked Mitch to call me doctor for 24 hours. <laughs> he said, let me, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I'll all of a sudden seem more important. I'll know more. No! I woke up the next day with a three-month-old, our fourth baby, changing diapers and going to work. Nothing changed, right? Even though all of this stuff that I had worked for changed. David wakes up the day after he has anointed the second king of Israel, and he goes back out to the field. And yet David understands with a depth and a spiritual maturity that you cannot just happen to have. He understands that because God has called him, he can wait on the Lord for the fulfillment of what God wants him to do. And so David goes back out into the field and he waits. Now just absorb that for a moment. Why would you call him to be the second king? Why would you set in motion all of this just to have him go out and bench it until you're ready for it? makes no sense. There's no linear path to that. It looks like inertia. It looks like inaction. It looks like, Lord, why didn't you just wait and hold off? Don't get his hopes up, right? And not to give away the lead, but he's not going to be seen as a king after he fights that giant either. It's going to be years and years and years. And in the meantime, look what his plan is. 
Verse 14. This makes no sense to human eyes. Not only does it make no sense to wait, but it, no, it makes no sense to send him into the palace of the man who he's taking the place of. It makes no sense. And, and, and Saul has no idea what's happening. Go back to verse 14 for just a moment because this is one of those uh, quizzical verses that seems like it kind of just throws your theological equilibrium off. Um, we're told that in the first back up a few verses that when Samuel anoints David's head with oil, the spirit of the Lord, Ruha Adonai, comes upon David. Then we're told in verse 14 that it gets off of Saul. Spirit of the Lord leaves Saul, and what is replaced is what the NIV and other translations will put in as evil spirit. By the way, that word evil is not used there in Hebrew, but the, the same word for what we refer to as the Holy Spirit is also referred to there, ruach, as the Spirit of the Lord. So what is going on, right? This makes no sense. Um, you have a situation where it seems like this haunting question needs to emerge, which is, does God stay in the business or get in the business of putting evil spirits on people? What is this? Why would he do that to Saul, right? Uh, James tells us in the New Testament that when we are tempted, do not say that God tempts you because God is not in the business of tempting, that we will give over to our own evil desires, but God does not tempt us. So is there a contradiction there? Is that an Old Testament, New Testament thing? No. No. What this is telling us right off the bat in verse 14 is that God is a sovereign God. God is in control of everything. And so even when God may not instigate it, even if it doesn't come from God, as evil does not come from God, um, it still is allowed by him. Okay, just saying that is going to rattle the cages of so many Christians. What are you talking about? This is why I don't understand God, right? Before you go down that rabbit hole, what happens more often than not in scripture is that God gives us over to what we want to do. Because God knows our mind and God knows our heart. In Exodus, when it says that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh, God does not make Pharaoh mean, but God knows what Pharaoh's natural inclinations are. He gives him over to it. When Paul says in the New Testament that God hardens the hearts of those he chooses, Paul is not saying that God's sitting there picking out of a hat, you go to hell, you go to heaven. That's not what he's doing. Paul is acknowledging the fact that God knows our hearts. He knows our mind. God is not going to brainwash us. He's not going to force us to love him, and he's not going to force us to follow him. God knows Saul's heart, and he knows Saul's mind. And Saul has grabbed power, and he is doing whatever it takes to keep hold of it. And so what God does by taking the Holy Spirit off is he gives him over to his own desires. So the internal struggle that just starts spewing like a volcano out of Saul is that internal struggle of knowing he is not doing what he is supposed to be doing in the Lord. And so what comes out of this volcano is fits of depression and fits of rage. And so all of his servants and attendants can see this internal struggle. Saul has no idea what all is going on. But that internal struggle, which we try to keep inside of us when we know what we should be doing, but we're doing something instead, it eventually just pours out to the world around us. Another thing I want to make mention of is that prior to Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come on and come off of people according to God's will. God would often give the Holy Spirit as a source of power to move through God's will. Um, after Pentecost, we know that the Holy Spirit is left with us as a comforter. Now you'll see in a moment, the Holy Spirit through the Spirit of the Lord is, is always a comforter. It didn't just start being, the Holy Spirit doesn't start being a comforter in the New Testament, but it's a different concept. So Paul, uh, Saul is no longer doing the will of the Lord, so the, the Spirit of the Lord is removed off of Saul and is put onto David. And when that happens and Saul is given over to his own inclinations of this internal struggle and he starts to spew and vomit all of this anger and rage. His servants look at each other, verses 15 through 17, and they say, 
oh, what should we do? <laughs> what do we do? Because they're the ones getting the brunt of the craziness. And they remember, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, that there's a, a, a time in Saul's life where there are prophets that are prophesizing, and there's music that's being played. And it tells us that the spirit came on to Saul and he was soothed. And so the servants most likely remember that time and say, ha ha, let's get a musician up in here. But who to choose, right? Who to choose? Now, this is one of those passages that I find to be just magical. Because it's one of those passages that humans think that we are controlling the puppet strings of the world and we have no idea that God is the one moving. So the servants think, aha, Eureka, great idea. We're gonna just send in a musician. And who happens to just be available? God is moving that situation. One of the things that is, is um, it's not a pet peeve of mine, but I, I, I kind of laugh when somebody says, you know, it's a God moment. And I kind of laugh because you have to say to yourself, if you're in God's will, Every moment is a God moment. It's just we just notice some of them. We notice the moments where everything seems to align in this perfect pattern where I needed $20 and I reached in my pocket and found $20, and so that must be a God moment, right? Every moment, if we are seeking the will, if we say to the Lord, you have my life, it is a God moment. And so these are one of those moments where it doesn't look like on the surface Anything good is happening to move God, God to move David forward, and yet God knows exactly what he's doing. It makes no sense to us. It makes no sense to us to say to David, hey, David, you know what my plan is for you? I'm going to put you in the palace of the person you're going to replace. And oh, by the way, he's a bit of a wild card who has fits of rage and depression. But don't worry. It's all to grow you. It's all to move you to the plan. What, what Christian memes and um, a lot of times Christian bestsellers tell us is not to pray for the will and the discernment of God. They tell us we can harness the will of God. You know, that, that we just tell God where we want to go in our life, we envision it, and then God gets on board and he blesses us with health and wealth. And the true redeeming quality of God's work in our lives is that when God asks us to do something, when we're walking through that dark room, it is going to be far scarier, far more confusing, and far more enriching than we ever would have dreamed. God's plan for David is not some serendipitous insert of him into the palace. God doesn't have to put these two men together. God could have created in, in, in David a hate, not that God's in the business of creating hate, but he could have seen Saul as his enemy. And again, I don't want to give away the lead, but when Saul dies, David mourns him. Why? You cannot have a heart for God and hate people. And so David being put into the palace not only opens us up to how God will show us and usher in the great shepherd in Jesus Christ, but it also shows us that God's plan, so they make no sense to us, to grow us, moves us into a place of awareness and growth. Okay, so look at the description of David. They found somebody, aha, one of the servants says, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who's a really good musician. And notice how they describe Little Davy in verse 18. A little different than what we heard last week. Um, he says, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine looking and the Lord is with him. Did anyone hear Scott read that and think, what changed from last week? When we left Davy last week, he was being referred to by his father as Katan, young and insignificant. He was being left out into the field and overlooked because Samuel needed to see the big strapping boys walk by first. So what changed? Nothing changed. These are those eyes of God. 
This is who David is. Maybe not in that moment, but this is who David is. And God is not embellishing David to get him into the palace. God is revealing Davis, David to get him into the palace. God is allowing the servants and the people around him to see David for who David is. The first thing we're told about David is that he's a skilled harpist. By the way, David is not running around the fields with a harp like Mary Kimball plays. That's not what the harp looked like. Okay, it looked more like a guitar. He's a skilled musician. All of those hours out in the field with God were not wasted for David. You could easily think of, I would think of, a young person having to spend hours and hours away from home out in the field chasing sheep would be useless and just kind of wasted time. Let's get onto the good stuff, especially if David's just been anointed the second king of Israel. Why I'd have to go back in the field? Let's get onto the good stuff. And the good stuff is that field. David has not become a prolific writer of the Psalms, one of which we read today, because he goes to a conservatory. David knows how to write for worship because David in the field is worshiping. David, as a shepherd, is spending long hours with God in silence and solitude. He is worshiping God. And I have people, especially now, tell me, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to watch church online. They've been saying that pre-pandemic too. I can worship God anywhere. And my response is always, do you? Do you actually worship God anywhere? Sure, you can. But do we use our time the way David used his time? The reason it's a big deal that the angels come to the shepherds first about Jesus' birth is the shepherds were seen as nothing. They were seen as nothing because they couldn't testify in a court of law. They couldn't testify in a court of law because they didn't go to the temple. And they didn't go to the temple because they were always out in the field. But David doesn't throw his hands up in the air and say, well, you know, I just have to wait till the skies are cleared and there's no more pandemic and I have my harp in the tabernacle and then I will worship God. He worships God anywhere he is. Again, not to give away the lead, but he is not going to be crowned the second king of Israel in public anytime soon. When Saul finds out that he's got the leadership role, he chases him. And so we know from the Psalms that David wrote that he worships God in caves, in hideouts, on the run, and in that field. When we look at our situations in life and our circumstances as just circumstances and things we have to get through to get to the good stuff, then what we end up doing is quantifying and qualifying our life's daily task, what Oswald Chambers will call the minutia of our life. And we'll quantify it as something either a waste of time or beneficial based on how we judge the outcome. But if you are being grown by God, you have no idea what the outcome is. You have no idea how long it is. All of those days in the fields were not for naught. They grew David. They began to give David a heart for God. I know that right now, this seems like, you know, a waste of time. And how many people I've talked to that just say to me, let's just get through this. Let's get to the other side of this, to when it's normal. But when we say those kind of statements, first of all, my, my, my first response to that is, then what is normal, right? David doesn't keep, God doesn't keep David in the field as a shepherd all those years just to be a normal. His normal is just to stay. It's to grow him as a king. So when we look at times in our lives or circumstances as either wasted or beneficial by us judging the outcome, we don't have God's eyes. Because there's no way you can look at a pandemic, isolation, no worship in person like we used to have it, no hugging and social distancing as good for anything with our eyes. So David becomes this prolific worshiper, and he's able to write the most amazing, heart-wrenching psalms for worship because of that time, not in spite of. We're also told that he is brave. This word gabor often used to describe God. He is a warrior, Chalel in uh, Hebrew. And we are also told that he is Bayin. He's able to discern um, with wisdom. And he's Ta'or, which means he's good looking, but to vain Saul, he's not as good looking as you, Saul. So he's good enough to stand by you, 
but he won't steal your thunder. And then we're told, and the Lord is with him. Again, except for, and the Lord is with him, and the harpist being good. The other part seems to just be exaggerated and embellished, and yet it is who David will be. There's this really interesting part in um, chapter 17, which is the next chapter, where David comes before Saul, and he kind of tries to sell himself a little bit on his strength, right? So he's going to be an armor bearer. And he tells this story that reminds me so much of our little tope tope kaboom story about wrestling snakes and sharks in Vermont. And David says to, to Saul, when one of my sheep would get taken by the mouth of a bear or a lion, I would chase it down. And I would take it out of its mouth. And you read that and you think, oh, Davy, sweet Davy. Really? A lion or a bear you wrestled? Samson tore open a lion with his hands, but he was Samson. And David, we know, has not all of a sudden grown physically overnight because when Saul gives him his armor to fight Goliath, it doesn't fit. What is that about? David saw in himself who God had made him to be, which is not only spiritual maturity, but it is honestly a gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to see with God's eyes. And it's not that David's embellishing his stories. It's that David understands who he is in the role that he plays. He's not in the palace for Saul because he's a mighty man. He's in the palace of Saul because the Lord was with him. And the evidence of the Lord being with him, verse 21, is that Saul, Saul loves David. And I know the NIV and what Scott read today, which was the RSV, has it as like, but this is the word ya'ab in Hebrew, and it means to love. What does that mean? Well, David had the spirit of the Lord with him. David had this relationship with the Lord where he was beloved by the Lord. That's what his name means, beloved. And because of that, people could see that in David. It was almost infectious to love David. So it's not that Saul all of a sudden um, changes. It's that he sees something in David that is comforting, that is an instant draw. What, a, what an amazing little tiny snapshot of what will happen when Jesus Christ comes. That the great good shepherd has in him an understanding and awareness that when people were around Jesus, they drew comfort. They had this peace. They, they, they knew that they were being cared for. And David has that same kind of relationship for Saul. There's this amazing kind of play on words that happens in verse 23 where it tells us that when, when Saul would have one of those spirits overtake him, Ruah, that David would play for him and he would settle, which is the word ravak in Hebrew, which means he could breathe again. So ruha means breath, spirit. So when, this, when he would feel tormented, what would bring him comfort? The spirit of the Lord in David. It wasn't just that David was this amazing, musical, gifted human. It was that the spirit of the Lord, the very thing that calmed Saul down way back in chapter 10 is the very thing that calms him down now, but through David. What an amazing foreshadow of what Jesus Christ does for us. Not just calm us down, but, but is the answer to our problems. It is a great irony that the answer to Saul's problems is the second king of Israel. Is God saying the answer to Israel's problem is the same thing that brings you comfort. The thing that brings people comfort today is a knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that was God's answer to the Israelites. It was God's answer to us and for us. But how strange of a plan would that have seemed? As ridiculous as it is to send David into the palace of the person he's going to replace, how ridiculous is it to send the Messiah into a world that is not only broken and dangerous, but as a helpless baby? to wait 30 years to even begin his ministry, to only have three years of active ministry, and to die a criminal death with very few people around understanding what was happening. That makes no sense. And yet the plans of God moving us through in growth don't make sense because they're not, they're not visible to our eyes. 
It is literally walking through that space, willing to be led by God. If David hadn't been David and submitted to the will of God, he not only would have missed opportunities to grow, he would have missed opportunities to the will of God, which is to be there in that moment for Saul. Because Saul lost the role of king, but he did not lose the chance to be known by God. And God gives Saul every chance to repent. So what if we just leave it with that today? You know, last week I encouraged you just to begin the week thinking about what does it mean to understand that the world needs new eyes, we need God's eyes. What if we just left it with the knowledge that we went to God saying, I'm willing to walk through that room with you. We have a three-year-old daughter who all of a sudden is terrified of the dark. And it is a most frustrating point to her brothers because when it is six o'clock in the morning, they will say to her, it's not dark. You can walk through the room. But she'll stand on the top of the stairs and she'll cry for me to come get her. And what I, what I realize is that it is not the light that she needs to walk her through it, it's me. I don't turn the light on, I just pick her up and carry her through it. And that little bit of knowledge of asking God to lead us is what we need. We don't need to not to be scared. We don't need to have the light on. We don't need to all of a sudden see what is in front of us. We just need the willingness to say to God, here's my hand, just walk me through it. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we, as we turn into a time of confession and communion, we pray, Lord, for your knowledge on our heart of those areas that we hold between us and you. Allow us, Lord, to see you, to encounter you at this table today, we pray. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, please join me in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and lead us out of from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. come to the table today as a reminder of the gift of salvation, the gift of freedom, the gift that means that we have a God who loved us enough to die for us, a plan that would have made no sense on paper. On that night when Christ was crucified and he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he passed the bread and he passed the cup he explained to them that this was his body that was broken for them. So today we eat in remembrance of Christ. Christ passed the cup and explained the new covenant. So today we drink in freedom as brothers and sisters of Christ until Jesus returns.
gracious Lord, take us out now into your world, whatever that looks like, wherever we are. Pray, Lord, that those who look upon us see you in us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.